Earlier, I mentioned that meaningless vote on the Paul Ryan budget. The House voted to pass it, but of course, that's the end of that. The Democratic-controlled Senate will have none of it. The president, along with every Democratic senator who can talk, all of them, have panned Paul Ryan's opus. Just one more example of how impossibly divided the two sides are. One of the congressmen who strongly supports the Ryan bill is Jack Kingston of Georgia. I spoke with him a short time ago. Congressman, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Elliot. Look, I, I listened to the president's speech the other day, and I want to see if we can get a point of agreement between the two of us. The fundamental divide between Congressman Ryan's proposal, which I gather you support, and the president's proposal, which I gather you oppose, is the president is saying, look, that richest 1% can afford to pay a little bit more in taxes. Congressman Ryan, on the other hand, balances the budget by putting two-thirds of the burdens on the poor. So I'm asking you, just as a matter of simple fairness, simple fairness doesn't what the president's suggesting make sense to you. The, the reality is that 75% of small businesses file their income taxes as individuals, and so that's skewed to make them look like millionaires. Um, that is their gross income, but their net income is, might be seventy or eighty thousand dollars. They're hardly in there with the Barbara Streisands and the, the the big time George Soros and the Democrats that are out there supporting President Obama. So, well, well, no, well just to clarify, I don't think the president was suggesting different marginal rates for Democrats and Republicans. I mean, I I know that isn't <laughs> what you were suggesting, but I just want to make make our viewers clear on that point. Well, you never know in this town, but, <laughs> right, well, but no, I, I agree well, with you. All right, these days, it could come out of Washington. Look. We're talking about people whose net income is 250, pick a different threshold, 500. You would agree that somebody who's making that much money could afford to pay a little bit more to help out in this case, right? I, I, I can. I do want to point out, though, on income taxes, people who make 410,000 a year or more actually pay 40 percent of the income taxes right now. So, you know, the, the idea that the rich are somehow skating, that's not reflected yeah. in the income tax code. But, but one of the things that I want to point out is if he puts his proposal on the table, I think it does deserve a vote up or down. But right now, he really has not done okay. that. Look, nobody's suggesting people are skating, even though General Electric, you'd agree that when GE, the company, had $14 billion in profits, it didn't pay any taxes. Something's wrong with that. You'd agree with that? Uh, I'd agree with that. And okay. also the fact that he just hired Mr. Imet, the, one of the chief uh, officers of GE, to work for him. Maybe there's a coziness there that we need to talk about. But if he wants to worry about GE's taxes, he's got the, the right-hand man of GE is now his right-hand man, and so he ought to put it on the table. Okay, look, you and I agree that Jeff Immelt coming in there to run the jobs creation is problematic, but let's not spend time on that. You know, because uh, you're a smart guy, you were in the insurance business, you know the job creation during the Clinton years when the tax rates were higher. We had 20 million jobs created. During the Bush era, after he had lowered those tax rates, we had virtually no job creation. So you know this causal link that you, that you, that, that you and your colleagues are relying upon simply doesn't hold up under any sort of scrutiny. But Bush, the Bush tax cuts created about 5 million jobs. Now, we had, they, we had they, a meltdown wait, wait, in real wait, estate. Congressman, I hate to interrupt. Where? In China? No, they created them in the United States of America. Where? A lot of them were tied into real estate. In our area, in Georgia, we had a tremendous economic boom in other states as well. And there, it is an article of faith. It's a theology with Congressman Ryan and many of your colleagues. And, you know, they agree. They, they feel this way. I disagree with them fundamentally. They feel that that higher tax rate is going to inhibit job growth. And the historical record simply isn't there. As you just said, the dot-com bubble had some real problems buried in it, obviously. But it shows that that higher marginal rate at 39 percent, which is what many of us are saying we should go back to, did absolutely nothing to inhibit risk-taking, investment of capital, new endeavors. We had an enormous explosion of capital investment during that period. And so if we went back to that, we could certainly help close this budget gap. And, you know, I'm with you. Let's deal with entitlements, but at least out of fairness, make taxes on the wealthiest Americans part of that equation. Well, Elliot, there are some lessons for Republicans to be learned during the Clinton years, because you are right in that. However, I would say there's lessons to be learned for Democrats, 
because of the Kennedy and the Reagan tax cuts. Both of those created enormous prosperity and new job creation. So I think we have models that we could say, what can we learn from both of these and how can we avoid the mistakes that both of them had? And look, look, I, I don't want to be outsourced any more than anybody else, but here's the thing. Very few companies, I don't know about CNN's tax, tax problems, very few companies actually pay at that marginal rate. You and I understand that. But I'm with yes. you. If we can find a way to lower that marginal rate by closing loopholes, that's the thing to do. Well, let me switch gears a little bit. Yesterday, Senator Levin came out with a scathing report about what happened on Wall Street. It's devastating. If you read it, it just confirms your worst fears about the games that were being played by the investment banks, the failed regulators, the whole across the board. You have been vocally opposed, I, I'm pretty sure I'm right about this, against imposing some, what I viewed as common sense but tough regulations on Wall Street. Why? Well, keep in mind, the president supported the TARP when he was a member of the Senate. I opposed it as a member of the House, even though it was a proposal by Hank Paulson in the Bush administration. I felt like we were bailing out Wall Street at the expense of American taxpayers. And, you know, you can argue if, if TARP was a success or not, and I agree with that. But I will say this, that... You do agree that internationally, as American companies have to compete against Asian and European countries, having the same rules and regulation is important to us. Otherwise, they transplant overseas, which is something that Democrats and Republicans don't want. Look, there's no question that we need to maintain a competitive advantage or at least maintain an equilibrium in terms of our international competition. But the one thing we can't let happen is to let these banks, which are global in nature, somehow use the boogeyman of international regulation that's weaker to drive down our capacity to share simple integrity in the capital markets. The American taxpayer has been fleeced, you and I agree on this, by Wall Street games, and they're going to go back to those same games unless we demand of them simple integrity integrity, simple transparency, no leverage, and they're heading back in that direction. If it's not derivatives, it's going to be ETFs, it's going to be something else. The only way to, pre to prevent that is to impose on them some simple obligations of, of, of honesty, and that's what I think we've got to do. And the only difference between you and me, Elliot, is I want everybody to jump in the pool at the same time. That, that's my big concern, and also to have, have some definitions. But as a guy who, who is a pro-market capitalist, I just believe that the big businesses, and Wall Street is big enough and the pockets are deep enough, that they can play both sides, both parties, anytime they want to. And I think what we need to have in Wall Street and internationally is more competition. And often the government has to step back to let the market work. And where that balance is, that is very difficult to define. But, but I do think that sometimes... We are rewarding bad behavior with these bailouts. Look, I agree we can't reward bad behavior. I also am a pro-market capitalist, but I just want the other guy to jump in the pool first. That's the only difference. <laughs> well, I agree with you there, but right now it looks like we're going to jump in first. All right, Congressman, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks for joining us. Okay, Elliot, thanks a lot. My